Welcome. I'm David Sturman, a senior policy analyst here at New America. We're here to discuss my new report launching today titled Defining Endless Wars, the First Step Towards Ending Them. To discuss it with me, we have Alexandra Stark, who's a senior research or a senior researcher with New America's political reform program, and Jason Fritz, who's a lecturer at John Hopkins um, Center for Governance Studies. But first, I'll present a short PowerPoint about the report and put some of its key findings out to you, at which point um, we'll move towards moderating moderated discussion and then your Q&A. Can we put the slides up? Um, so the topic of this report is defining endless wars. Um, next slide. And to go over it, I'm gonna focus on six main things this report addresses or does. First, whether endless war is a mere pejorative or whether it has meaning. Second, what is an endless war? I present a definition in this report. Third, are the wars the US is currently waging or the counterterrorism wars specifically endless wars? Fourth, I'll quickly run through uh, um, quickly run through a framework that this report presents on how to analyze endlessness. Fifth, a short discussion of why it matters if our wars are endless. And then some concluding statements and recommendations. Next slide. So this paper comes out of watching a number of um, articles and comments come over 2020 that dismiss endless war as being meaningless, missing the point, vacuous, a trope or talking point. Um, some examples are here. But in my view, this misses the core of what endlessness is, that it actually does have a meaning rooted in our culture. Now, I think it's important to note that these sort of crit these criticisms of the concept of endless war come at a time when there's been a lot of misuses of the concept. Um, to talk about things that are not ending endless war or um, just as an actual political talking point without content. But to dismiss the concept as a whole, um, in my view, misses how deeply rooted it is in our culture and strategic discussions. Next slide. For example, if we look at um, George Orwell's 1984, we have a concept of continuous war or permanent war, where he differentiates between the previous wars or war throughout most history that usually ends, as he puts it, in mistakable victory or defeat, and the war between the super states of 1984 that he compares to the battles between ruminant animals whose horns are set at such an angle that they are incapable of hurting one another. This concept of a war that um, goes on but there's no threat of either super state losing the war um, is sort of central and really is pretty big in our culture um, as this um, widely cited um, book on the subject should demonstrate. However, it's not just fiction as seen in the next slide. Around the conversations over the Vietnam War Endless war emerges in strategic conversations. For example, here we have a quote from Leslie Gelb's 1972 testimony on the Vietnam War. Quote, there are costs that we cannot run away from, but it is better than persisting in an endless, hopeless, and tragic war. A concept he expanded upon in his book, The Irony of Vietnam, which also uses the phrase endlessness. Um, next slide. It's not just Gelb though, here we have a selection from the Marxist Magazine Monthly Review published in 1969. First note is titled Vietnam, colon, Endless War. But more interestingly in this um, screenshot I have here, you can see that they're reaching back to a historian that uses the phrase endless war 
to discuss the German experience in theory in World War I and World War II, and then proceeds to pull this forward to discuss Vietnam, uh, which um, really runs counter to arguments that this is a mere talking point or something that people have not used as a concept to describe their experience and even attempted to put forward fuller analytical understandings of to interpret how wars occur. Next slide. Some other reasons I reject the conclusion it's the mere pejorative are the widespread use of quagmire language and other synonyms for endless war, including forever war, Recent research, as you can see on the right, in the field of studying civil wars that has actually given the concept of quagmire an operationalized definition that can be compared across large N data sets. That the phrase has been used before 9-11 and also in wars that don't involve the US as a central actor, including Columbia's civil war and the New York Times referring to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as endless. Another sign, that um, endless war might be a concept is that our enemies use the concept. In a letter to the American people, Bin Laden warns the US specifically that they're waging a war without end. And while that's certainly propagandistic in its use, it shows that this is a concept that is being drawn upon both by people within the US strategic studies, but also rivals to the United States. Next slide. But the existence of references to endless war does not mean there is an actual usable definition. In this report, I present what I think is a useful definition that can ground analysis. In my view, wars take on an endless character when two conditions are met. First, when a belligerent adopts objectives while lacking the capability to achieve said objectives. And second, when despite the inability to achieve those objectives, the belligerent is not at risk of being defeated itself. And I would add here also not at risk of being denied um, access to the battlefield. Next slide. By focusing in on objectives, we can pull out a few concepts about endlessness and ways to understand it today. For one thing, a focus on objectives suggests that there's no direct relationship between troop numbers and ending endless war. Just because troop numbers decline in the absence of a statement of objectives and statement that reframes objectives to be achievable um, does not mean anything. There's no linear relationship there. Um, the core is to look at objectives as a key determinant. Now there's two things to think about with this definition that might challenge it. One is unexpected systemic change, saying that a war is endless seems to be a statement about what is to come. Um, however, we should not understand endlessness as just about duration. If there's a sudden systemic change that's unexpected or not part of the belligerent strategy, that doesn't mean that the war strategy they've been pursuing has not given a characteristic of endlessness prior to that sudden systemic change. Um, people still feel that endlessness. The other concept is how do you divide war from other activities, whether it's training or war by proxy. My report focuses on direct US coercive military action. You could certainly define it to include training. In my view, that broadens it too much, but it's um, a fair thing to look at. Next slide. So are we waging endless wars? Well, one sign to look at is the duration of the wars. I would suggest based on this list that we certainly do seem to be waging endless wars. Another sign is the extent of political and public rhetoric using the phrase endlessness. The last three administrations, including the current one, have all used endless war or a concept similar, like forever war in their speeches. In addition, President Biden's um, competitors for the 2020 Democratic nomination, or many of them also use this concept. Um, now, these are not necessarily proof that our wars are endless. As noted previously, the core of whether a war is endless is the objectives. But I would submit that the objectives the US has chosen in its counterterrorism wars 
remain expansive to the extent that they're not accomplishable, whether it's the defeat of ISIS, which still several years in has not materialized, or whether it's the defeat of Al-Qaeda that Obama suggested we were on the path to, a path that then wound for another administration and continues to wind in this new administration. Um, to my eyes, that suggests that we are, we have set objectives that are not accomplishable or being accomplished. Next slide. So I propose a framework for analyzing how that endlessness arose, focused on four factors. One, that the, there's a the lack of an enemy capable of posing an existential threat to the US or denying access to the battlefield. Um, we can discuss more about my assessment there um, later, but I won't focus on that too much. Second, expansive and unlimited objectives. Third, unclear or undefined objectives. And fourth, a lack of war termination plan development. Next slide. So expansive and unlimited objectives. Here I have four quotes regarding what the United States is seeking. The first one is from George W. Bush right after 9-11. And it's pretty expansive. It says not only Al-Qaeda, but we're fighting all global terrorist groups and they will be found, stopped and defeated. Now, this comes maybe a couple of days after 9-11. And I think it's fair to say that to some extent, the war has certainly been narrowed since that largely rhetorical statement of what the objective is. But as we can see in these next three quotes, that narrowing is not actually all that much of a narrowing. We have Obama promising or stating, we've sent a message from the Afghan border to the Arabian Peninsula. We will not relent, we will not waver, and we will defeat you. A rhetoric that seems pretty similar to Bush's comment. We have Trump in this recent presidential campaign stating, that he would wipe out global terrorists who threatened to harm Americans. And now the Biden administration comes with Biden during the campaign having written that he would narrowly define our mission. But what is that narrow de mission definition? It's still defeating Al Qaeda or the Islamic State. Not really much of a narrowing except from the heights of the Bush type, every global terrorist frame. Next slide. So I present a framework for looking at what our objectives are actually saying. In my view, we should distinguish between unlimited objectives, which are very difficult to achieve and may actually be incoherent when it comes to terrorist groups, because they're generally understood as meaning an objective that seeks the destruction of a government. Terrorist groups generally are not governments in the same way that a state is. Um, but even if we look past that, the evidence suggests that they are very difficult um, to achieve, especially via military means. What might signal that you're waging an unlimited objective or a war for an unlimited aim? Words like lasting defeat, defeat presented without a qualifier like territorial, or words like destroy. In contrast, we can see the US could pursue limited objectives, which are objectives that do not seek the total destruction of the terrorist group or the government. I think we can divide this into transformative objectives, things like territorial defeat that seek to rewrite governance or social conditions in an area, but not necessarily destroy a terrorist movement as a whole. Um, the history of US intervention suggests to me that this is pretty difficult to do, although not as difficult depending on the specific transformative aim as simply destroying a terrorist group as a whole and extirpating it from the Middle East. And then there's disruptive objectives, things that seek to not rewrite um, governance, but seek to destroy a particular um, threat or capability. These, might, these, as you might expect, could be signaled by words such as disrupt, or a core example is targeting of high value targets that are viewed as a particular danger to the US rather than as a way of destroying or mitigating the group's overall capability. These can actually be not that difficult to achieve, although in operational terms, um, there are certainly challenges. 
But the larger problem comes that while they may be accomplishable, they're often unsatisfying. The reason being that the danger generally arises out of systemic and social conditions, not out of a particular individual or set of individuals, um, which suggests that once the disruption is done, when the threat arises again, because it is rooted in those conditions, it will um, actually find that the US is pursuing a transformative objective just not deploying the means necessary. Next slide. So I also look at unclear or undefined objectives. If you don't define your objectives, you can't determine if it's achievable. That's a great way to get endless war. But also if you're shifting your objectives, that's another way to get it. And I present a set of definitions for analyzing specific cases in the paper. Next slide. And then finally, war termination planning. You might have an objective that appears to be achieved, say something like the ter territorial destruction of ISIS, but where the assumption is that it is only achieved insofar as the US continues to apply military force. In other words, not actually ending the war. Um, and I present sort of a framework for analyzing this in particular cases, defined as the amount of planning and development of efforts to hand over security provision and the actual war fighting if the war continues after the US removes itself to another party that is not the US. Um, next slide. So that's the framework. Why do we care? Some people assert that the costs of the US's current wars are not all that high. For example, the number of fatalities for US troops in Syria or elsewhere are relatively low compared to previous examples um, or previous conflicts. In my view, this makes a temporal error of analysis. It analyzes the war's costs before it's done. We've seen in Syria that there are actually substantial escalation risks, whether it's clashes with Russian-backed semi-state forces, exchanges of fire with Syrian government forces or Turkish forces and Turkish backed rebels, or in Iraq where the US actually exchanged fire with the Iranian government after an Iranian backed militia killed a US um, contractor there, bringing us to what many um, feared might be the brink of a larger war, although it seemed to back off from that. Um, this poses problems with this sort of theory of mowing the grass that has emerged in US rhetoric. But even if the escalation issues can be managed, fighting endless wars and the decision to do so militarizes American politics and has democratic risks, as President Obama himself acknowledged when criticizing the dangers of being on a permanent war authorization footing. And it also has impacts on the areas where the US wages its wars. It's certainly not beneficial for a society to have an external power waging war in a way with no sight of how it might end and with little ability of people in those regions to actually affect the United States. Next slide. So some conclusions and recommendations. My paper suggests we should reject equation of troop withdrawals with ending war. It's about the objectives, not the troop numbers. The numbers can go down and up, and they have, both in Iraq, where the Obama administration returned to fight ISIS, in Yemen and Pakistan, where there have been pauses and returns to airstrikes. Uh, we should also abandon unlimited obje objectives of defeat. Instead, we should state our objectives in specific measurable terms and tend towards limited objectives in most cases. We should open space for negotiations with groups deemed terrorist. Um, this is particularly important as it's something that unlimited objectives tend to militate against. If we fight wars, we should push a transparency agenda that makes clear why they're being fought, what the objectives are and how they're being fought. And then we should probably repeal the 2001 AUMF and if, the US populace decides that there are still wars that need to be fought, those should be authorized with specific authorizations about particular areas and enemies that name the objectives 
and make the case for why those are achievable. Next slide. And I'll just leave you with this quote from Representative Lee, three days after the 9-11 attacks, that I think emphasizes a couple of things. First, the fear of an open-ended war or an endless war is not new. Um, second, this the effort needed to make the point about endless war um, is a lot more difficult to make in the wake of a major attack or a crisis, which is something to be concerned about when you have a large number of people in the foreign policy community pushing the um, idea that there's not actually meaning to endless wars. And finally, just to note that in the days after 9-11, this may have been a or this may have been a warning about what the wars would become. But now, almost two decades out, this is really a diagnosis that, in my view, should not be controversial of where we're at. And it's in some ways depressing that we're not able to recognize that our wars have become endless, so we can move on to discuss how we get out of that. And thanks with that, I turn it over to Alex to um, present some questions. Hi, um, thanks for joining us uh, for what I think is, <clears throat> excuse me, a really important conversation, um, especially at the start of a new presidential administration when there's room hopefully for fresh and innovative thinking about our kind of conceptions of national security, what does security mean? Um, and more specifically about this topic, which as you point out in a way has been with us uh, for decades. Um, and David, thank you so much for presenting this incredibly thorough research. Um, so David, I'm gonna start with you, um, but Jason, keep in mind, I'll ask you a similar question after this. So um, as you point out, endless wars is one of those terms that is used so often in the media world and the policy world by politicians. Um, but in spite of that, it's not clear that we actually have a shared definition of what that term endless wars actually means. Um, and I think this can lead to analytical confusion and it certainly, and it can also dilute the potency of the term itself. So if you're applying it to such a wide range and a variety of types of wars or interventions or proxy wars, um, you know, we don't really have a common language to, to understand what is the concept or the thing that we're talking about. So I was hoping you could start by explaining a bit more um, the inspiration kind of behind this report. Why do you think that we need to define endless wars in order, as your title says, in order to end them? And um, what will having a shared definition mean in analytic and in policy terms? Yeah, I think that um, this point about not having a shared meaning is really both true and at the center of why um, I sort of put together this report. Um, part of that is sort of what I see as misuses of it over the past four years in particular. For example, justifications of the so-called withdrawal from Syria that Trump put together twice, both times calling it an end to endless war, despite there still being troops in Syria and despite there being a public commitment that the US would continue to wage airstrikes and harry um, ISIS in Syria, but just move its troops. Um, I think it's pretty objectionable and also not in line with really any understanding of what a war is to view a movement of troops out of a particular area as an end in the absence of some broader peace deal or a decision to rewrite sort of the societal understanding of what's being done. Um, and certainly not to claim a war that's now just pursued via airstrikes um, or airstrikes and more secretive special forces activity as an end to endless war. Um, I think there are some alternative definitions to the one I present that are worth considering. Um, there's sort of a tension between a single war that takes on endlessness and endless war as a broader societal condition where society keeps fighting wars that may have different objectives. Um, and I think there's also, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's the main one, but I think there's something about our particular moment that makes this concept of endlessness 
when many of the wars do seem to not just be repeating, we see that too, but the wars themselves taking so much longer and lacking this um, clarity or even a concept of when or how they might end. Um, the only other thing I would add is, I think one lesson of this report is that um, saying a war is endless is not the only root of criticism that should be made about wars or could be made about wars. A war could not be endless, could be very quick, but also be immoral or otherwise bad to do, um, either immoral or counterproductive for US interests, but still end quickly. Um, and I think those should be sort of separated for a discussion of a broader anti-war position and a discussion of what it is specifically about endlessness that is so dangerous. And uh, turning to you, Jason, I'm hoping you can talk a bit about your, your general response to the report as well as why it might be useful to have these conversations around defining the term endless wars. Yeah, thanks, Alex, uh, and thanks for moderating uh, this discussion. And David, uh, thanks for having me, and thanks to America as well. I, I really like this paper for a number of reasons. Um, first, it gives content to a, a political term that's been been thrown about, um, and it allows us to think about it in a more in a more analytical way. Um, but I, I think it also has some more uh, theoretical and policy implications as well to add. Uh, add some definitions. I particularly like this this definition around objectives. And I, I teach military strategy to master's students, uh, and then of course that's based mostly on Klaus Fitz's uh, conception of you know ends, ways, and means, right? And if we don't have ends that we are achievable, how do you align the ways and means with that? Well, you get the last twenty years of of what we've we've been experiencing. I think it's also important to recognize that this is in the mainstream of both foreign and military policy. Right, the idea that we should have attainable objectives is codified, if you will, in the Weinberger and Powell doctrines of the, of the 80s and 90s in the aftermath of the Vietnam War. Uh, this is an issue we've been dealing with for a long time that we jettisoned after 9-11, and it's probably time uh, to make a return to it. Uh, I, I think, David, also the in the paper bringing out the, the particular characteristics of this series of wars against terrorism is, is important. And there's, there's an element of the nature of terrorism and, and in fighting it uh, that makes it particularly prone to this endlessness. I mean, Raymond uh, Aron in the 1950s, looking at France's war in Algeria was talking about how, you know, if you're the colonial power, you have to have complete and total victory to be considered to, to, have, to have won, but terrorists can throw bombs, uh, like as, as criminals can commit crimes, it's impossible to stop it. Um, so there's not really any point in perpetuating a war to prevent uh, what is inevitable. Um, there's also the policy implications of, of objectives that are wide ranging, but also very, um, I, I wanna say it's sort of like definitive because defeat is this, it's this nebulous idea. Well, what does that mean? There's no, there's no actual definition of what defeat means, I guess other than there's no more terrorism, um, but that also makes it a very uh, definitive uh, term as well, and that it's 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 complete, um, and, I, and I think there's a tendency for that to to drive our thinking and how we approach these wars as well. I mean, did you talk about the uh, effects of uh, of the of these wars on the areas that that we fight them, right? So if we think that the, if the goal is to defeat terrorists, then we will that's how we will focus our efforts, right? And then that that creates uh, policies and strategies that actually only exacerbate the problem, right? So if we if we focus on the whack-a-mole of terrorist leaders and middle management, and we have we approach that with uh, drone strikes and bombings that have collateral damage that create grievances that create terrorists, like there's it's this self-perpetuating um, system that's, that's based off of this mindset that's encapsulated by this term defeat. Um, and that, that changing how we think about how we are engaging with uh, with the world, really, in, in addressing these real security challenges for the United States, um, but putting them in the proper context compared to the other the other threats that we're facing, and how we how we should approach just the other peoples of the world. Yeah. So this this um, question of, of the objective of defeat is really interesting. I think uh, 
um, David, and and I would even build on that to say you kind of um, you define endless wars as uh, a mismatch between these uh, sort of maximalist objectives and then the capabilities that we're willing uh, to invest to achieve in these in these outcomes in a way. So whether or not we're able to achieve them is in part, I think, um, a, a function of the resources and 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 time and uh, whatever we're willing to invest. Um, and I think this is a problem that you can identify even more broadly across um, U.S. policy, at least in the Middle East, which is kind of my area, um, where you see maximalist policy aims like um, regime change in Iran, for example, rather than pushing Iran to make specific concessions in some cases, or in Yemen, um, where the objective is forcing the Houthis to, to unilaterally capitulate or, or, or fighting a war to defeat of the Houthis rather than um, negotiating some kind of power sharing agreement. Um, so David, can you talk a bit more about the problems of having defeat as an objective? Um, and, and why does the United States continue uh, to maintain defeat as a goal in our counterterrorism wars even af after you know, 20 plus years of, of little success there uh, at best? And, and what are some of the problems with continuing to have these, um, these maximalist objectives? Yeah, I think, um, well, to begin with, in my view, um, defeat when it comes to terrorist groups or terrorist movements is generally incoherent. It's not the understanding of what defeat means or what an unlimited objective is um, in much of strategic studies um, and sort of the theorization is about governments. And governments have a set of sort of state structures and an understanding of how they relate to each other um, that makes an unlimited objective regarding to them more understandable. Um, it's become common or was common even in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 to compare to the Japanese surrender in World War II and say, there won't be one like that. Well, one of the reasons there won't be one like that is that Japan had an actual state and the US objective wasn't, we're going to hunt down and kill every imperial figure and call this war not over when we discover a few holdout soldiers on X Island or a group that continues to deny that Japan lost the war in another country. Um, that wasn't what the understanding was. But when it comes to Al Qaeda, because there's not that same level of institutionalized state structure, um, the name just keeps popping up and gets sort of redefined through sort of decentralized networks. And that poses a problem for when one wants to actually say the group has been defeated. Um, but I think even if one views sort of a terrorist group as something that can have an unlimited objective against it, um, the history of sort of terrorist groups suggests that it's very difficult to defeat them. Um, you can see this through sort of the large um, databases of here are all the terrorist groups after 1968 and how did they end? Well, a large chunk of them have not ended. And I believe the grand study of this from a ways back found only about 10% were ended through military force. And then um, figures like, um, some figures have pointed out that even that probably overestimates and it um, looks at groups like the Red Army faction and groups and small groups that might be defeatable by policing together with larger groups that um, are more entrenched. And when we look at the jihadist groups the US is waging wars on and the larger movement, I think we can see that they are both entrenched and have a long history. We've been fighting ISIS for in some form for um, 17 years, and arguably they go back to at least the 90s, but at least 2003, depending how you want to date that. Al-Qaeda is more than 30 years old, um, old, and also more than 20 years into it, more than like two decades and a half into its own war against the US, and about two decades into sort of what we generally recognize as the war after 9-11. Um, and you can just go through these. At the same time, they've decentralized. And not only is there the entrenched aspect, 
But now anyone can pick up the name Al Qaeda to some extent. Um, and if there's just a modicum of linkage back to bin Laden, or even a group like ISIS that is formally fighting Al Qaeda, um, it becomes understood as the group has not been defeated. Thanks. Um, so I, I want to talk a bit more about your point about the connections between endless wars and the militarization of American politics. Um, because I, I think too often we act as though there's sort of the sharp or natural distinction between domestic and foreign policy that, that simply is not the case. That's especially a lesson that we've learned over the past year with um, the, the pandemic and, and protests around racial justice. Um, and there are complex ways in which our domestic politics is shaped by our foreign policy objectives, our national security objectives, including what we choose to prioritize as a, as a national security threat and then how we choose to address those threats. Um, so can you talk a bit more about what you mean by uh, the militarization of American politics as a potential um, problem that comes out of endless wars? Um, and how have endless wars kind of shaped our politics and society and to what extent will we need to reframe domestic politi political debates and conversations in order to actually end endless wars? Yeah, I think there's a couple of aspects to this. There's um, cost to the people actually fighting the wars that aren't um, soldiers dying that are often dismissed. And the willingness to accept those ongoing costs is its own coarsening of American society. Um, and the asking of people to keep waging war and taking injuries, um, either actual physical injuries or moral injuries, um, is really something that coarsens our society and politics. I think there's also sort of the backwash of the um, militarization and creation of the military structure that can come back to policing in terms of um, theories about how to police, but also equipment. I think we're at a particular moment to be concerned about this as we rightfully react to a domestic extremist threat, but there's a whole bunch of theories about waging war on foreign terrorists and extremists that those wars um, have not been successful in absolute core problems in their own theory. And now there's the danger of those being ported back to the US. Indeed, in many ways already were being ported back. There's always back to the 70s and earlier been the cycle between America's wars and domestic policing. Um, and then I also think we just need to think about what kind of society chooses to wage war and use violence without an actual end in sight. Um, I mean, I talk in the report that we can imagine cases where it might be moral to wage war without knowing what the end might be. In my view, the cases where that may be the case tend to involve much starker threats or dangers to the polity than they do in the US. Um, so if you're actually at risk of genocide or the destruction of your political um, ability, the imposition of dictatorship, it might make sense to keep fighting in the hopes that there might be a sudden systemic change that you don't know what it is. But when the death toll from jihadist terrorism is according to our tracking in the almost 20 years since 9-11 is 107 people. And those people were killed with one possible exception by people who did not have direct material ties to foreign terrorist organizations. Answering that with um, what's keep fighting wars abroad and the death tolls that keep building up that aren't American, um, to me strikes or strikes me as profoundly immoral and profoundly coarsening to the way we react to other problems. Um, I mean, 107 deaths is tragic, but it's also similar to such things as industrial accidents or mass shootings generally. What does it mean when we accept in response to the foreign threat, um, just ongoing wars and airstrikes with hundreds to thousands of casualties as an appropriate response. When it comes to assessing 
what's happening at home? And how do you justify that distinction without a racial or citizenship-based emphasis that has very severe dangers of its own? Yeah, um, so Jason, on, the, on this question of the relationship between um, endless wars and, and US uh, politics and society, I know you've written about the militarization of US policing um, and, and you yourself also have experience with multiple tours as an army officer in Iraq. Um, can you talk about the links between endless wars abroad and police militarization, both abroad and at home? And then um, sort of from, from your perspective, how endless wars have, have affected and shaped US politics and society. Yeah, so the way I see it, there, there are three direct linkages between uh, US foreign policy and these endless wars and, and police militarization here at home. And those are through material, through psychologically or culturally. Um, I think the material is pretty clear. It's the things that we've seen, particularly since uh, the events in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014, all the way through the events of the, this past summer, um, the, just the number of the, the tools of war that are in the hands of police. Um, and those things are directly related to these, these long wars. And this isn't the first time we've seen uh, this cycle of, of militarization through materiel. Um, we saw this in the 1990s as the uh, Cold War had come to an end and the wars such as they were on uh, crime and drugs were, were being waged, where you saw a massive explosion in the number of SWAT teams across the country, which was recorded by uh, Brian Kraska, um, to uh, just the, the giving of, of both military equipment and tactics to, uh, from the military to, to police forces. Um, we saw a massive spike in the Trans, uh, transition of military equipment from to police art to police uh, agencies uh, as the surge in Iraq wound down and as we started winding down in Afghanistan, um, there was just a lot of excess and there's this policy uh, and program for the United States federal government to give equipment through it. Um, beyond the material though, which is, which is important and it is related to the other two, there is this psychological aspect of these never ending wars that it, it, it primes the population to be on a war footing and to at least partially accept that that is the case, that there is this threat that's out there that's going to potentially kill them and that it must be defended against, um, which is why it, while militarization of police is not particularly overwhelmingly popular, uh, there's still a large segment of the population that is perfectly fine with it because of the perceived threats that are, again, psychologically primed by uh, this, discuss this talk of war um, when it doesn't really resemble that in many ways. And then finally, it's culturally. Um, this one's a little harder to, to nail down concretely, um, but I guess there's, there's this term in you know, military circles called tactical. Right. There's the rise of the, the importance of special forces, which have always been seen as elite and, and cool uh, inside military circles, right? And, and that has pervaded into civilian society, uh, particularly in policing circles, uh, and also perpetuated by the um, transition of former special operators into uh, SWAT teams uh, in particularly major jurisdictions. Um, and so there's this idea of, it's the same reason we see these militias uh, playing, you know, dress up soldier, uh, it's because it, it looks cool that, it, and there's this, this cultural element of, of, of being a warrior uh, that, that's be very difficult to, to eradicate. I mean, we can create policies to remove uh, military equipment, take it out of the hands of, of police, but the, the cultural um, inroads are going to be very difficult to reverse. That's so interesting. So um, I have a few more questions, but I also wanted to remind the audience members that you can drop your questions into that Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and we will uh, look through them all and try to respond to as many of, as possible in the time that we have. Um, but so these um, recent conversations around uh, the COVID pandemic and, and whether and how health is a security issue have in a lot of ways reminded me of, of the shock of the 9-11 um, terrorist attacks and how much our entire national security framework kind of shifted in response to that, um, which in turn led to this militarized framing 
um, and, and a militarized approach to counterterrorism, which is um, exactly what you're talking about in, in terms of these endless wars. Um, and so I, I, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how we can avoid those mistakes of the, the post 9-11 period and the war on terror um, and this endless war framing when it comes to addressing new and emerging threats, whether that's um, you know, the pandemic or, or uh, great power competition or, or racial injustice in the United States or, or any of the other number of emerging issues that we're, that we're facing. David, do you wanna start and then we can go over to Jason. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how well the framework I present ports over to issues that aren't sort of military or conflict in nature. Um, just, I think um, some of the dangers and costs of pursuing objectives that may not be achievable um, just aren't as significant or as morally dangerous um, when you're not talking about an activity that's actually doing violence to people. Um, but I think there is sort of an aspect of um, a focus on slogans and um, whether that's sort of an improper use of endless war or um, defeat as a slogan, but not actually meaning it. That's important to keep in mind across many issues. And I think particularly when it comes to something like the focus on great power conflict, um, it's important to not replicate the sort of willingness to use military force or violence without an actual, without sort of two things. One is an actual understanding of what you're using it for and why that's achievable. Um, but also without sort of, um, the danger of the violence or fighting becoming its own purpose, which I talk a little bit about in the paper, but I think there's a danger, especially one, once, once one is waging an endless war for the war fighting to become its own meaning. Um, there's arguments about this looking at the jihadist side that question whether jihadist terrorism is really and particularly jihadist terrorism in the West is really something strategic designed to achieve ends, or if it's just people are replicating an aesthetic of rebellion that happens to be jihadist flavor. And even if it's meaningfully jihadist, whether that itself is just its own aesthetic and not um, an actual strategic theory of how the West will be defeated. And I think the US and its partners are very much at risk of replicating that, whether it's um, a broad sense of counterterrorism in itself as always being justified or necessary and overhyping of the terrorist threat and the importance of responding to it, or sometimes through rhetoric of leadership divorced from what US leadership is meant to actually produce. Um, do we need to keep fighting in Syria to preserve US leadership um, if that leadership is not actually conducive to the aims it's designed for? Um, I don't know if that really gets to the point. But... Jason, do you wanna to respond to that at all? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's the militarization of US foreign policy, which is, I don't know if it's a driver of the endlessness of these wars or a symptom of it. Um, I don't know which arrow of causality and which direction it goes in. Um, but I, I think looking at the, particularly the Trump administration's reaction to COVID such as it was, um, put it at the feet of, of the military in Operation Warp Speed. Um, there was an article I saw this week that in West Virginia, they've done a pretty good job of rolling out vaccines because they gave it to the National Guard to do. And there is truth that there's one, the Department of Defense and particularly uniform personnel are one of the very few, just very large uh, logistics capacities that, that exist in the US government, but we're not asking why is that the case, right? Why are we giving the military jobs that are better suited for civilian agencies? Um, and we go, okay, well, they have the resources. Why do they have the resources? Well, because we're fighting this endless war, right? So rethinking how, 
uh, we see these conflicts, how we combat, um, and here I am using military terms again, um, terrorism. Um, but I, I think part of this, this conversation, and this is a starting point, is just fundamentally rethinking the role of the military in US society. So um, I wanna to turn to some of your policy recommendations, especially uh, now that there's a new administration and a new Congress, um, there's some room to think about what they could be doing to address these problems. Um, and one thing you mentioned, David, is possibly repealing uh, and replacing the AUMF. Um, we've already seen a bipartisan push in, in Congress to do that, led, of course, by um, Representative Barbara Lee, who you mentioned, um, but uh, members of, of Congress on, on both sides who appear interested in this. Um, uh, I think he, he was just confirmed, but uh, the Secretary of State nominee or, or confirmed uh, Tony Blinken um, told senators in his hearings that, that the Biden administration feels strongly about possibly revamping the AUMFs. Um, so there's a lot of energy around, around this, but at the same time, um, in past efforts to repeal and replace, we've seen, I think, substantial differences in opinion um, among members of Congress about what should actually replace the 2001 and 2002 AUMFs. Um, and some critics, for example, have pointed out that it, you could replace it in a way that actually it makes the authority even more expansive, um, rather than actually reasserting Congress's role in author authorization and, and conducting oversight of the use of force. Um, some of the issues that analysts have, have pointed to are um, how a replacement AOMF should speak to which combatants it's actually authorizing force against, about um, you know, where geographically force can be used, uh, sunset provisions or, or some kind of provision where Congress would have to kind of positively reaffirm um, an, an authorization, authorization periodically so that for it to stay in force. So that's not, I think these all speak to kind of your your points about, about endlessness, about uh, defined objectives, about limited objectives, and of course about having an exit plan. Um, and we don't have to talk too much about the AUMFs, uh, even though I'm a Congress nerd, but <laughs> do you wanna talk a little bit about the relationship between um, the AUMFs and endless wars and what Congress and the Biden administration should keep in mind when they're thinking about um, authorization for the use of force? Yeah, um, so for my report sort of discussion of the AUMF, um, to me, it really derives from, um, I view the 2001 AUMF and also the 02 Iraq one um, as being core examples of this, um, not actually defining what the objective is, doing that with unclear aims or shifting, um, or sort of just an unlimited objective. Um, I mean, the original one is all necessary means to go after anyone tied to the 9-11 attacks, which as representatively pointed out at the time is both open-ended, but it's also just an incredibly expansive objective. What is the US interest served by hunting down every single individual in progressively further and further associated links to those who actually committed the attack. Uh, and to what extent is it actually important to US interests to find them all and take them all out versus destroy specific structures that allowed the attack to occur? Um, I think this goes to part of the valorizing the actual war fighting over the pre presumed aim, unless that presumed aim has been accepted to just be revenge. Um, which I would reject as an immoral objective to put the power of the US state behind. Um, I think in terms of the specific policy items, um, I think for me, at least as a way of thinking about it, um, the beginning point should be to repeal the AUMF and then discuss what comes next. But the AUMF should not be repealed in a way that just means the president pursues the same objectives, saying it's all justified under Article Two authority. Um, I think that would not be productive. The goal is to have the debate that comes about what we're actually fighting the war on in a way that 
defines the objectives, provides reporting on the objectives and transparency roles that should be integrated into an authorization. Uh, sunsetting might be a good way to enforce that and to prevent sort of mission creep over time. Um, but really it's a question of the authorization itself should um, tell us what the objective is being done and come from a leadership that actually weighs that out. And that when we conceive of a possible repeal that we get competing visions of what that might look like or would be good, is it self-suggestive that the authorization is no longer functional and functioning in that manner, um, which is a good reason to repeal it and replace it with something else if we still view ourselves as needing to wage war or stop waging the war. Jason, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I'm specific to the AUMF. Um, I'm also a big fan of repeal and replace, particularly of sunset clauses. I mean, ideally, having sunset clauses would uh, drive at least having the debate and forcing Congress to vote on it however often they need to, a year or two years, however long um, you need to keep the authorization going. I mean, I, I can't say that I'm terribly optimistic that that would be a robust debate because there are plenty of constituencies in the US that you know, don't want to be soft on, on, on terror. Um, as far as other recommendations, uh, there was, I don't know, a year or two ago, a discussion about potentially having a commission, a congressional commission, to review US counterterrorism policies across all agencies over the last 20 years as we get close to the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Of and I think that would go a long way to truly investigating how effective our counterterrorism policies have been over the last two decades. I mean, it, I mean it, there's more terrorism in the world today than there was in 2001, so it doesn't speak very well for how well we've been doing, um, although there have been no major catastrophic attacks in the US, so that's in the plus. But we don't, we have a hard time assessing how things have gone, at least from the specific counterterrorism perspective. Uh, and I'd like to see that that commission come to fruition. And if I could, there's one more thing um, that's a little, I think it's a little more in the weeds, um, but as we're talking about objectives here, uh, and, and, and we are talking about war, is how how did the Department of Defense get to this point where it's in the driver's seat, accepted that, um, you know, I don't like to attribute any sort of malice in the way that the you know military officers have uh, played their role. I, I think uh, that part of it's just the optimism of the officer corps, broadly speaking. That you know, when asked to wash windows, they can wash windows. Um, but it does expose a glaring hole in the professional military education of our our senior military leaders that we can continue to have these maximalist objectives uh, just year after year after year with not much to show for it. Great. So I have a few more questions about the policy recommendations, but we also have a bunch of great questions from the audience that I want to get to. Um, I'm going to try to kind of collapse them in, into a, a couple of questions because um, they, they speak to similar themes. But so um, David, the first question uh, is sort of about definitions. So did you think about, um, or how do you think about proxy wars um, in Yemen, for example, as, in relation to endless wars? And do you also think about um, sort of how, how the enemy or the opponent is, is viewed or, or designated as part of, of the endlessness? So if you're you know, defining an, an opponent as part of an access of evil, or if you're um, you're refusing a certain political status or saying it's a terrorist organization and therefore we can't negotiate with them. Um, what does that mean in terms of endless wars? And then, so that's the first set of questions. And then the second set is um, about the means. So, and Jason was, was speaking to this as well. If, if this endless war uh, framing has not really worked in terms of counterterrorism, um, I don't, of course, think you're suggesting that we should just ignore terrorism entirely or something like that. But what is the alternative approach to, instead of having defeat as an objective, what should the objective be? And what is, what is the better approach? Is it a, a military approach? Is it a policing approach? Um, how do you think about that? I'll start with David and then, and then over to Jason. Yeah. Um, first, I want to just add that I also think um, a commission reviewing our sort of war on terror, counter-terrorism practices 
is a very important um, agenda item. And I think there was a legislation to do some of that in the NDAA that got stripped out, I think, although I don't follow Congress that closely on this. Um, I think there's also been calls from Matt Dust, Senator Sanders, his policy advisor, for a much broader version, which I would also push to not understand it as just review within the security services. And then just quickly before I answer the questions to note that Alex also has a policy paper that maybe it's not so recent now, that is probably the core thing to look at for what authorities Congress actually has to use on these points. Um, but to sort of the designation or definition of the enemy, um, I think that's a big part of it. And I view that as in large part tied to the decision to pursue unlimited aims um, against them, which is partially produced by the decision to label them terrorists. But also it's the decision that we have unlimited objectives. That means we need to destroy them and extirpate them um, and not just sort of remove a particular capability. And where I think that really comes, where the rubber hits the road on that is the question of negotiations and how if you have an unlimited objective, well, then you can't really negotiate with the enemy, it's something very much encapsulated in the general trend to refuse to negotiate with terrorists, um, which I think was very destructive in Afghanistan where we're now negotiating with the Taliban, um, but refuse to really draw them into a discussion of post-Afghan governance in 2001 when we would be radically in a better position, much stronger to shape conditions of that. But I mean, even looking beyond a group like the Taliban, I think we need to start thinking about not to say that it is possible now or open, but what it might look like to negotiate with an Al Qaeda group or even ISIS splinters that um, we may not view that as reasonable or a good outcome now, but the refusal to even countenance it, uh, that sort of moralist rejection to it um, is part of how we got to this problem beforehand. And it's replicated across a variety of contexts like Israel saying it won't negotiate with Hamas and now that's what it does. I mean, Hamas was not a particularly restrained actor regarding civilians during the second intifada. Um, that doesn't mean there wasn't a need to actually start even in the limited way and problematic way it is towards uh, mutual interaction. Um, but I think, yeah, I think that's the core aspect of it. Sorry, what was the second question? I know I asked you so many questions. So the second set is, is uh, if the endless wars framing isn't working in terms of our approach to counterterrorism, what what does work? Is that uh, a policing approach, something else? Yeah, I mean, I think I would start with initially questioning, is our aim of what we want the terrorist threat to be reasonable? And what is the actual terrorist threat to the United States? And then what do we care about outside of the US homeland? Um, and I think first defining those, and I think to some extent regarding the US homeland, um, part of the problem is just we have unreasonable expectations of what it's okay to use military force for, um, seeking no attacks over multiple decades to me is not really reasonable, or I mean, somehow it seems to have been largely achieved over these two decades, but um, certainly unlikely to be achievable in perpetuity. More broadly, I think my sense is there is, we should understand the jihadist movement broadly as existing and as posing a real challenge to the United States and US interests that I think we should care about protecting um, and sort of humanitarian causes. But the decision to wage war as the answer to that is something that should be perceived in particular instances and not the broader response. And once one shifts away from that, you can respond with 
greater policing for security, aid or expansion of economic opportunities to try and push down the justification for the threat, you can also respond with negotiations. Maybe some of these groups, we don't actually need to be at war with them. We may not like and may find their sort of views of what governance is to be immoral or vastly engaged in atrocity. But I mean, there are many other states and movements in the Middle East that also, um, I think most Americans would view as immoral or their viewpoints, and we don't wage war on them. Um, so I think that's another thing that begins to open up. And with hope, um, if you start shifting away from the war, we should also not to say this is just a simple solution because it is not, and we should expect there to be violence if there's US withdrawal in a lot of places. Um, but we also need to remember how the US decision to be on a war footing has pushed the jihadist movement itself towards more and more acceptance of atrocity, which is something that wars do to protracted wars in particular due to both sides engaging in them. Jason, do you wanna to speak to this, this question uh, in particular of what, what is an effective approach to counterterrorism or what could an effective approach look like? Now, I think um, moving off of the war footing is important. As I mentioned earlier, the, this is this aspect of our approach to this war just creates more grievance uh, throughout the world that just kind of helps perpetuate, if not always directly, then, then, uh, then indirectly. I'm also reticent to suggest policing as, uh, as an option, at least when we're talking about outside of the United States. Um, there's a tendency for our police assistance throughout the world to be highly militarized. Um, so really all it does is continue this, this war approach just with blue uniforms instead of green ones, right? Um, and that's just, that's equally problematic. It also increases the repressive capacity of a lot of already repressive, pretty repressive states that we consider allies in their fight against, uh, against terrorists. Um, I think there is a, an opportunity here with the Biden administration coming in um, with the, the Global Fragility Act having been passed, uh, I guess, late 2019 now, um, which was, while it's about fragility and development and, and, and political engagement in the world, was really ultimately about fighting extremism of the type that, we're, that, that creates the terrorism that we're talking about today. Um, and it's... Um, you know, I, I haven't talked to anyone in the State Department in the last couple of months about this, but when I last talked to some folks in the fall, they, they still didn't have the strategy out uh, and to meet the requirements of the Global Fragility Act that was required by Congress, and it seems the Trump administration may have just punted uh, on that, which suggests that there might be a blank slate for the Biden administration to take up uh, and use the Global Fragility Act with the resources it comes with to really think about very hard about how to approach extremism, violent extremism in a different way than, than had been uh, previously. Because one of the issues has always been where are the resources to do it differently and where's the will? Well, it's not ginormous, but there, there, it exists here in the, in the Global Fragility Act. Great, I wanna dig into this question of policy recommendations and, and what the Biden administration can do uh, even more. Um, David, you mentioned in your recommendations the importance of not equating troop withdrawals or number of troops with endless wars versus ending them. And I think um, someone pointed out in the questions, this is a, an interesting point because um, the object, whether the objectives are achievable is also shaped by, you know, the numbers of troops you put in, the, the resources you invest. Um, so now that there is a new administration in office, uh, can you talk a bit about what, what the Biden administration, uh, in your view, ought to do in its early days, especially to kind of forge a path? So um, in Afghanistan, for example, uh, the Biden administration is facing a pretty immediate decision about whether to move forward with the agreement that the Trump administration um, struck with the Taliban, which includes a complete drawdown of US troops from Afghanistan by May. Um, or to take another example, um, I, I, have, I think, the administration is, is getting a lot of pressure around um, ending US support for uh, the Saudi-led coalition's war in Yemen, which is something that candidate Biden um, had promised to do uh, 
So what what should um, the Biden administration approach be and, and what should they be taking into account um, specifically when they're looking at, to end either these wars or the other wars that you, you've mentioned? Yeah, I think um, to start with, I view sort of the report as providing a framework that can be applied to many of these cases, but the answer you get from applying to those cases would depend upon sort of the specific analysis of conditions in those cases. And I don't claim to be an expert on um, the current state of the Afghan conflict or where the negotiations are now. Um, so I, I wouldn't presume to say withdrawal, yes, no, this is how to do it. Um, what I would say is that in sorting those, um, the administration should make clear that here's what the aim we would like to achieve. Um, here's, is that aim actually achievable? And if it's not, we shouldn't do it. Um, I think the sort of willingness to embrace uh, com committing to endlessness in Afghanistan and the willingness to view that as sort of a low cost activity to do is part of why we're here almost two decades out with um, debating how to withdraw in pretty, um, how and whether to withdraw in pretty sort of unfavorable conditions compared to what it might have been um, several years ago. And there's, I don't think there's really public willingness to commit to sort of that continued activity. And even if it can be done, um, assuming that sort of policy is sustainable is a good way to run into something like the Trump proposed Syria withdrawals where um, supposedly it just surprised um, all these um, administration officials and others when he just tweets it out, but also Trump made his willingness to and desire to withdraw clear for years before he actually tweeted out the withdrawal. And it's a failure of the officials to have not prepared an actual effort to um, resolve that in a way that is conducive to actually ending the US involvement and ending the US war rather than waiting for the president to get sick of it and sick of the options available. Um, the only other thing I would say is cut out the defeat language, which unfortunately it looks like the Biden administration is going to port over for the fourth administration in a row since 9-11, um, because again, it doesn't have meaning. And I think everyone who's working on this issue knows we're not going to defeat them. And Biden should know this. I mean, the Obama-Biden administration embraced the al Qaeda's on the road to defeat language. And we're now here four plus years later. And I think everyone should know that claim turned out to not hold any meaning and to not be an actual accomplishable aspect, an ever receding concept of what defeating Al-Qaeda is that can never be produced, can never be cited. And anytime you claim to defeat it, even if you have, even if you viewed the defeat as a more limited objective as what you're really pursuing or really just care about protecting the US homeland, when you use the defeat language, people correctly criticize you for not actually defeating the organization because they know that's not what defeat means, which is why Trump got fact-checked for claiming ISIS is 100% defeated. And yes, it might be the case that he really meant we'll destroy the territorial structure, but that doesn't hold water when you're also out there after the killing of Baghdadi saying, we're going to hunt down every ISIS member and bring the wrath of God upon them or when you send a letter the next year to Speaker Pelosi saying, we are continuing to fight for an objective of defeating the Islamic State. Um, people know it's not true. So let's cut that language and say what you actually mean. Jason, do you wanna to respond to this question of, of um what the Biden administration uh, can be doing to end, end endless wars and how they should be maybe framing or thinking about this. Yeah, thanks. Um, 
I, I think, you know, David brings up a good point here about how troop numbers, it, they're, it's not directly correlated to ending the endless war. I, I think that someone could take this report and say, well, the, the answer to ending the endless war is just to bring all, all of the troops home. And that isn't necessarily effective towards our policies and counterterrorism, but also in other ways. And I think the two cases David brought up are, are very good ones. Um, you know, I, I, the ham-handed approach to removing troops from battlefields by the Trump administration worked against the objectives that we were trying to, to achieve. So let's start with Syria very quickly. Um, you know, we had a very small number of forces in Syria when um, President Trump tweeted that we were pulling out and, and did. Um, but that small number of forces were doing very little counterterrorism at the time where we were pulling massive weight way beyond the size of the force that was there. They were acting as a guarantor, a guarantor for the commitment problem between Turkey and the Kurds. They were deterring uh, the Assad regime and, and its allies from invading that part of, of Syria. And by just saying, well, we're ending the war and we're leaving, it, it, it just introduced a significant amount of new violence and uh, instability into the region, which certainly didn't need it, right? So it wasn't even a lot of troops and maintaining them there for a little while probably would have been the smarter thing to do. Same thing with Afghanistan, or at least similarly. Um, you can't have negotiations about withdrawing from Afghanistan while declaring you're pulling your troops out of Afghanistan. You know, what is the incentive for the Taliban to take these negotiations seriously after some some active action like that? Um, they'll just continue to wait us out if we're just like, all right, we're just going to leave. Like it has to be part of the negotiation with organizations that we don't like to negotiate with, but we have to do it in order to make sure as best that we can that we're leaving in as orderly uh, a way as possible, that as many of our objectives are being achieved uh, as possible. So, um, you know, as the Biden administration uh, starts, you know, taking its own lead on how to address this endless war um, or endless wars. Uh, I, I, I would caution uh, listening to some of the the more far progressive uh, voices that say we just need to pull out now and get out because the reality is it could create more of a problem uh, than we face already, and that an or an orderly end to endless wars um, uh, is is the way to go. And I would add on to that, that if um, if the policy aim is to just get out, which I think is not an unreasonable thing to consider if there's not sort of a achievable end being presented to how alternative aims um, could not just root us back into another couple of years or decade of endlessness. Um, you have to actually mean that. And what I think we saw with Syria was that's not what the Trump administration meant. In fact, they come out after Turkey um, invades to fill the vacuum the US leaves and say, well, Turkey's not really capable of achieving our interests, which should suggest that we still had interests that we cared enough for to engage military force. Otherwise, we would have accepted that as the reasonable cost of that withdrawal plan. Um, and that's something that needs to be in the discussion of the proposal to end endless war. And one of the risks I think there is that, is that people underestimate the danger of snapback. And partially that's, people underestimate that as sort of criticism and that they imagine the US could never come back after withdrawing from some of these countries when in my view, the, if there was a substantial enough threat, the US probably could come back but it also comes from those who want to withdraw in underestimating the amount of material, economic, and psychological ties that tie us to why we use military force in the first place. Something um, I wrote about previously with the counter ISIS war and how the increase in the ISIS threat um, triggered another sort of US interest in protecting Americans at risk of being overrun by ISIS, trying to rescue Americans held hostage, and then sort of psychological dynamics of how those specific limited objectives get interpreted into broader aims that require the unlimited aim of defeating ISIS. Yeah, it's so interesting that we come sort of full circle to this question of needing to have a shared definition for endless wars and and whether we're actually talking about the same thing or not. Um, and we had another uh, definitional question from the audience. So someone wanted to know if you 
um, make a distinction between the endless wars of the post 9-11 period, specifically the counterterrorism wars, um, and uh, they're asking about um, post-1945 when um, in some cases the United States has, has tried to act as a, a global peacekeeper. Um, David, you mentioned Vietnam uh, as an example of, of when the kind of endless war terminology has been invoked. Um, do you make a, a distinction between the post 9-11 period and, and what comes before that? Or um, do you see similarities or maybe both? I think there are similarities and I find a lot of that writing on Vietnam to be um, speak to the current moment in some substantial ways. Although we do need to note that um, the cost the enemy was, well, the cost the enemy was capable of projecting on the battlefield um, were much higher in Vietnam. The US has successfully diminished even further the pressure that can come from casualties um, to pressure to end the endless war. But at the same time, um, I think there was less of a sense that the North Vietnamese would follow the US home and continue to pursue attacks. Um, I don't know entirely how justified that sharp distinction is, but it certainly is a distinction. The only other thing is I would distinguish between something like the US presence in Germany or Japan, um, which in terms of sort of direct military application of force, um, my definition would be slightly different in interpreting that versus the current endless wars we're fighting. Um, but I think that's another area where one needs to define what exactly one means by war. And there's absolutely definitions that would include that presence. Um, I think that was a bit more understood as a training or deterrence presence than some of what we're doing now where there's more of a active um, use of the violence, but I mean, these are tough definitional questions. And I think we just need to say specifically what we're referring to when trying to analyze them. Thanks. Um, so we have a just a few more minutes. So I wanted to um, end on a question, but also give you both the chance uh, to, to give any concluding re remarks or final thoughts that you have. Um, I, we've talked a lot about ending endless wars, um, what the Biden administration could or should do. Um, and Jason, you, you talked a bit about the Global Fragility Act, which is um, really interesting, but I wanted to spend just a few minutes more talking about the actual, not just ending endless wars, but the policy alternatives. So what should we be thinking about, um, not just in terms of counterterrorism potentially, but also to avoid and to end uh, complex proxy wars um, additionally more broadly. So uh, we've talked a bit about development and diplomacy and that that's what really comes to mind for me. Um, I, I talk about uh, Yemen a lot. So I'm thinking not just that the Biden administration should end its support for the Saudi led coalition, which is uh, I think more towards your, your definition of endless wars, but also um, you know think about for example, where we have leverage to uh, achieve some kind of negotiated settlement there. Um, another example might be reassessing our relationships with Gulf security partners like Saudi Arabia. Um, arm sales, that's is an issue that's come up, especially in Congress in, in recent years. Um, and, and the Biden administration has indicated it's something that they're, that they're um, wanting to look into. So can you speak to sort of in general terms, what kinds of policies we should be thinking about not just to end endless wars, but also as altern alternative means of, of addressing these um, problems. And in addition, if you have kind of concluding thoughts or remarks, uh, that would be great. So I'll start with Jason and then end with David. Yeah, alternative approaches, I think I think you're actually right. Uh, there's, there's diplomacy and there's development, but I think specifically democratization, uh, which has a, has a bad, uh, connotation after the neocons and you know the Iraq War, um, but I, I, a non-militarized democratization I think would go a long way um, towards uh, improving just kind of the conditions in the world as as best we can. I mean, the U.S. cannot force or even coerce 
or cajole uh, our partners into accepting full democratization. By that, I mean uh, institutions that are competent, which is a development issue, but also uh, inclusive of all of its citizens. And that ranges from uh, military to police to just sort of the, the regular bureaucracies of a nation. Um, the part of that is going to be um, changing our mindset uh, away from away from militarization. Uh, we have a tendency to focus very heavily on military uh, assistance and training as part of our counterterrorism and also something that we may not consider part of uh, forever wars, but at the same time, um, militaries aren't supposed to be fighting internal to their own borders, right? Unless there's an active civil war ongoing, uh, that's the role of the police, but then we make the police look like the military and so on and so forth. Um, I would like to see a massive change in how we approach our partners around the world uh, and use what leverage that we have to push them down a path of more inclusive institutions and the right institutions for the problem at hand. Yeah, I agree. And um, I think the Yemen case is a great example where this report focuses on endlessness as perceived from the United States. But we need to be very clear and not pretend that ending America's endless wars means the endless wars um, that the US has participated in, um, which may in some ways be rooted in the region's politics, but we have also certainly contributed to, and in the case of Iraq, created out of mostly just not existing there anymore, whatever you want to say about societal conflict in Iraq previously. We were the ones who made that a war. Um, and those aren't going to end because we remove our troops or we stop pursuing our unachievable objectives. Um, so I think we both morally need to recognize that. I think um, my hope would be a United States that is not an active belligerent in these conflicts could maybe take a role in promoting negotiations to bring an end to them, creating the space for the um, peace talks, the sort of provision of aid money that might help sustain a peace agreement. Um, I don't want to, and maybe the US leadership could take on that role rather than leadership as leading the war effort. I don't want to overestimate um, how much I think that might be able to transform the Middle East, but, and not dismiss the dangers of US non-military leadership um, as something that does not have its own problems. But I think that would be something good and what we could hope could come out of it. Um, yeah, and I think just sort of thinking about the sort of intercultural connections and what it would mean to have a more well-funded State Department focused on those issues, more funded civil society. Um, if you look at some of the writing on the Vietnam War from figures like Martin Luther King Jr. or Rabbi Heschel, they really come back to this concept of the US waging war on behalf of people that it doesn't really know imposing US objectives over demands of the local population and the inability to know what is needed when you're an active belligerent. Um, so that would be my hope and what I think we should look to, as well as efforts to make reparations for the various acts of violence that we have taken that have been beyond um, what is generally understood as acceptable in war, and really for much that is generally acceptable um, in war, um, whether that's civilian casualty payments, um, whether it's refugee admittances to the US. Um, I think that's the least we can do as we withdraw our participation in endless wars for those who will still suffer the endlessness of the wars that we have contributed to. Thanks so much um, to you both. And uh, folks can find the link for David's report in the chat, I believe. So I, I encourage you to check that out. Um, thanks to our audience and for coming and for your great questions. And especially thank you to our events team at New America um, and Narmada and Shannon to help, who helped us organize and, and pull this off. So thanks everyone. Uh, see you next time.